This is the uh, Interledger Community Call. It's Wednesday, October the 4th. Um, we're kicking off today with discussion of two issues that have been raised recently by uh, one of these proposals from Evan and Stefan to uh, firstly um, do some quoting through an alternative mechanism uh, using failed transactions and then a, um, a proposal from Stefan to potentially even drop the amount from the ILP packet completely. So we're going to kick off with those. I'm not sure, Karen, who, who wants to go first? I, I think it would make sense for Evan to discuss his proposal first and then uh, define yours sort of built on his and maybe, maybe we do yours afterwards. And maybe we leave um, discussion, uh, other than clarifying questions, discussion until we've heard from both of you. Um, I think that makes the most sense. So um, I'm going to hand over to you, Evan. Uh, take it away. Sounds good. OK. So. Uh, for a little bit of background, the way that Interledger currently handles quoting is uh, there's an Interledger quoting protocol, which is kind of on the same level as the Interledger protocol, where we expect all clients and all connectors to speak it. And what you can do is you can ask for a quote saying, here's a fixed source or a fixed destination amount, and look at that for you. They can use a variety of different methods, but kind of the fallback is that they will ask another connector for a quote, and that will kind of propagate through the network. Um, at a recent discussion that we had, Stefan proposed an idea for making quoting end-to-end -end where the idea was instead of expecting that all the intermediaries in the, in the network speak a different quoting protocol, basically the idea is you would just send a payment through the network and then just see how much gets to the other side. And that's what you would use for quoting. And it makes sense that that would sort of be a good way of quoting because instead of sort of specifically asking a question, you're just sending a test payment and then just asking the receiver how much got there. So he, he had kind of mentioned that idea. I took a stab at both implementing it and writing, up, writing it up. When he had proposed it originally, I was very against the idea and was arguing against it pretty strongly until during that course of that argument, I convinced myself that it was a good idea. Um, and so then I tried implementing it and was really surprised at how easy it was to implement because if it's end to end, you don't need to touch any of the intermediary components. There was one little change that the connector needed in order to support this. We'll get into that in a bit. Um, but the whole rest of the change was completely isolated to the ILP client module which was cool. Um, and it probably took me like four hours worth of work to, to put together a, a close to reasonable implementation of it. So that basically convinced me that it was a good idea. Um, there's a bunch of other reasons to make it end to end. There's also arguments like, um, depending on the application you're doing, you may want like quoting may mean something different to you. So if you're doing a single payment, um, you may a static snapshot may be okay. Uh, but if you're doing something like streaming payments, then you have to take into account the liquidity information over time. And so even if someone was to give you a kind of snapshot, that wouldn't necessarily be valid over time. And so you'd have to just take in, take it into account in a different way, which suggested that quoting is really part of the application layer and it's dependent on what you're doing with it. So by making it, by getting rid of how we do quoting right now and replacing it with end-to-end -end quoting, that makes it part of the application layer. Um, that's kind of the idea in a nutshell. There's the more specific proposal in 309. Um, roughly what you do is you just send a payment that you know the recipient can't fulfill, and then they reject it with an error message that includes the amount that got to them. That's basically the idea. Does any, anybody have any questions about that? Going once, going twice. When, uh, so just a quick one, in Evan, the process- Just a clarifying one. When you, when you say um, a payment that they can't fulfill, how, how do you guarantee that? Like, What are the specifics of of how you send a payment that you know they can't fulfill. The, the current proposal is that you send a, a payment where the condition is just all zeros. So it would be practically impossible for somebody to come up with the fulfillment for that. Oh, 
Okay. Couldn't couldn't the fulfillment just be like a random number? Well, that's not. I mean, you could make it any random value instead of just a fixed one. Um, the main, like, there's kind of two main ways that you could do this whole end-to-end -end quoting thing. There's the main proposal described in issue 309. There's also an alternatives considered thing at the bottom. If people are interested in weighing in on that, there is a different design that would include doing different uh, conditions. I don't think it's really worth going through that right now unless people are very interested in it, but um, would be happy to discuss that more if people want to. No, no, let's, let's, so, so I, I'll stick to my rule. That was just clarifying questions. So cool. I think I, I understand the proposal. Yes. There's no questions about specifically what's being proposed. Um, so unless anyone else has questions, we can get to the answer. Uh, I, have a, I have another question. Cool. Um, how Perfect. does this proposal work if you want a certain amount to arrive at your destination. Like, let's say you want to make sure that the receiver receives $100. How do you get to know what you have to send? So basically, you send a test payment of any size, get back the, the amount that got there, and then use that. Then you know the rate between your source amount okay, so and the destination amount, and then you can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so that means that the rates are are fixed. There's no longer uh, the, uh, possibility that rates differ on the amount of the payment or something like that. Correct. And there's a, there's an uh, an appendix in um, issue 309, which I'm interested to hear people's thoughts on. But um, that is one of the important differences between this model and the way we were previously thinking about it. And um, there's a number of different reasons why I think that. Uh, assuming or sort of forcing the rates to be linear makes sense and a lot of that has to do with um what it came down to for me is that i think no matter what we do the network will ultimately have a maximum payment size and i don't actually think that payment size will be super large i would personally guess that it would be on the order of like 10 to 100 dollars and so the argument for just because i think there will be connectors that are for a number of reasons incentivized to keep the maximum amount per payment relatively small and if they do that then there's a, there's less of an argument for making the rate vary a lot because you're not talking about payments of 10 cents and 100 million dollars you're talking about anything from like you know one cent to a hundred dollars i think it's reasonable to have a linear exchange rate between those okay makes sense yeah but that that is a like that is definitely a debatable point about this, so happy to take comments on that. I think we can discuss that now or feel free to comment on the issue as well. I tried to write up the motivation for that in that appendix, so uh, let me know what you think of that. Yeah, let's um, let's, let's get through yeah, I, I, I didn't read it, but before we get into the details, guys, if you don't mind. I, I, I would want us to just okay. for everyone to understand the proposal as well so that you, you're clear on what's being proposed. Um, and then once we've done that, I think because they're, they're quite interdependent, so I think it's useful to just for us to get through both. Then we've got the whole rest of the hour to, um, to, to dig into the, is it a good idea, as opposed to do we understand what is being proposed? Okay, so um, as a, basically as a result of working on this, um, I realized there was one feature in the connector that would make this not work, which is that at present, the connector, the last connector or the connector that notices that it is the last one in the chain will attempt to deliver the exact amount specified in the ILP packet. Now, if you don't know what that amount should be, that obviously causes problems because you're trying to figure out how much gets to the other side and the connector is trying to be helpful by delivering exactly how much you specified, but in this case, it's not helpful. The other problem is that currently, if the amount is too low, the connector will reject it with an insufficient insufficient source amount error, which also causes a problem. So I made a proposal for how to add a sort of magic number where the connector wouldn't wouldn't do this delivery behavior. Um, that turned into a different proposal where Stefan has a has a different way of looking at what to do with the amount in the interledger packet. So I'll turn it over to him now to explain that. Yeah. So when Evan was talking about the connector behavior. Um, he said that all the connectors ignore the amount, so they actually don't even look at it. 
um, with the exception of the last connector. Now, it's actually, in reality, it's a little more complicated than that, where um, it may not be the very last connector in the chain. It's just the last connector that's doing any kind of currency exchange or charging a fee. Um, and we call that connector the, the connector that's delivering the money as opposed to a connector that's just forwarding the money. Now, this distinction between forward and deliver um, has been an, an absolute sticking point in trying to explain IntelliJ to people. I've, I've tried to explain it to a lot of people. There's a large issue that's linked um, on issue 312 on the RFC, um, if you want to read about that distinction. Um, but basically, it, it's sort of the, the last connector that's doing, a, a, that's doing an exchange rate. After that, the amount will stay exactly the same. And so that's the connector that would enforce a precise amount if you're trying to deliver a precise amount to the recipient. Now, obviously, this this is a little complicated, and this isn't very elegant. And you know, back in the day, the reason we were arguing for that was because we wanted to serve a use case, which was essentially, um, I'm a receiver, and as a receiver, I want to re receive a precise amount. I don't want to accidentally be paid like, you know, 0.1 percent more than you know what the invoice actually was for. Now. Looking at it with a little bit of hindsight and in retrospect and with everything that we've learned um, and also looking at Evan's proposal for, for the quoting protocol, you know, I was kind of like, well, is, is the solution that we've come up with, is this like forward versus deliver distinction, is that really the best way um, to ensure or, or to serve that use case of, of precise amounts being delivered? And so once we, once we looked at it again over a bit more, um, I think what I'm coming to the realization is that actually a better way would be um, to have the recipient deal with it. If the recipient wants to receive a specific amount of money, um, they can do any number of things. They can send back the amount that's too much. Um, we could add a feature where they can fulfill the last transfer and basically pass, like basically pass in an amount that's that's the exact amount they wanted to receive, and so the remainder goes back to the connector. Or you could reject the payment and the connector and, and kind of mention the amount that you wanted, and then the last connector could kind of resend it with the correct amount. And none of these require this distinction between forward and deliver to be hard-coded in the connector. And so um, I think it's going to make connector de development a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about um, whether ledgers are local or not. Uh, that's the determinant for whether you're forwarding or just de or, or delivering. Um, and so it's going to just make the connector behavior a little bit simpler. And I don't think we lose anything by making that change. But what it does mean is that now no connector actually looks at the amount field. So the amount field becomes sort of this purely informational field that's kind of end-to-end. -end. It's something that maybe the transport layer protocol looks at, maybe the sender receiver use for something. Um, and I think for backwards compatibility, we may want to keep it in there. So that's why I changed the, the title of that issue from deprecate to ignore. Um, but essentially, like we would just define it as a field more like data, which is also in the LP packet as a purely end-to-end -end kind of field. So that, that's, that's all I got on that, and I'm very interested to hear um, uh, your thoughts or questions. Cool, any questions? Yes, this is David. Clarifying. Uh, thanks. Hey, I've got, I have a question. Um, I'm curious if you could just elaborate a little more on um, like how the two, imagine a world where these two sort of ways are both being used. <clears throat> so maybe like could one connector use sort of like ILP1 uh, and another connector ignore or does every connector in a chain, in a payment path have to kind of treat the, the amount in the ILP packet the same, either ignore it or kind of honor it in the current way? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So. As I mentioned before, like today already most connectors ignore it, right? And so it would just be like as if all the connectors were just forwarding connectors, which is a concept that already exists. The one change that you'd probably want if some connectors don't deliver or if you can't rely on the fact that some connector along the chain will deliver, i.e. send the exact amount, that means that the receiver needs to be able to accept amounts that are larger than what they expected. Um, because if they end up working with a connector that doesn't have that delivery functionality, uh, you would get an error back. You, the recipient just wouldn't accept the payment. Um, 
if the recipient and the last connector or the delivering connector are sort of coordinated, like for instance, if the recipient knows that they're uh, using a connector that has that functionality, they could continue to use the old behavior. So it's really just um, if you have like an old connector as the last connector and the new receiver um, or vice versa, then you would have a potential issue. And the, re the receiver already has an option. To, there's a, a flag called allow overpayment, and that's set to off by default. So we would change that. So, so just clarifying the, the issue, the case where you'd have an issue would be there is an overpayment, but the receiver is like set to not allow that. Correct. Or the connector is set to deliver the exact amount, but the receiver is expecting it to let through something where the amount in the packet doesn't match what they're looking to get. Right. Couldn't we make these changes non-breaking by just saying, well, this new stuff is, an, is a different uh, ILP packet type, and then just keep the current uh, ILP packet as it works now? When you say as it works now, do you mean keep the format the same or keep the connector behavior about it the same? Yeah, the meaning, so the behavior about it. Well, I mean, again, like it, it you're all, we're only changing the behavior of the last connector. It's kind of like it's a change in how you recommend how connectors are configured. You just you never recommend connectors to be configured with the is local flag on any of their plugins or any of their routes. So it's like, I don't know, it, it's it's hard to say how this is like a protocol change. It is certainly changing the expectation. Like, you know, I wouldn't expect LQPV2 to work because I would expect some connector to do the delivery and, and kind of mess it up. Um, but it's still, it's not really, it doesn't feel like a protocol change. You know what I mean? Like all the formats staying the same, most of the behaviors staying the same. It's more like, do you expect the connector to do the special case of delivery? Uh, and we're saying like, we're, we're going to deprecate that behavior. Yeah, I, I wanted to, I was going to suggest that, or at least that was a clarifying question for me, was it seems to me that, Stefan, your proposal is not actually a protocol change at all. It's a change in how we implement connectors, and and that um, all that we're saying is the behavior of the connector changes from do I differentiate between forwarding and delivery to how do I respond when I get an error from an upstream connector to say um, I overpaid, and and that seems like pretty much that all that changes. I guess um, I, I'd have to check, but does the overpayment error ex, uh, express exactly how much was overpaid? And if not, that would be something that does need to change. Yeah, I actually don't think we have it. There, there is no overpayment error right now, and we would want to define that and put in the amount so that you could handle it in this way. Hmm. Right. So I have a it's question about it's an implementation stage, and that's it, really. Uh, wait, what, what was that point? Just that it's an implementation detail? Yeah, so it's, by adding this error, we add, um, by adding this error, this additional information when an, an overpayment is made, all we're doing is allowing connectors to change how they're implemented. But the protocol doesn't actually enforce that. Connectors could still look at the amount that they want to and try to differentiate between forwarding and delivery. Um, it's just going to be, you know, people will be able to pick what they think is a better way to implement the connector. It, off the top of my head, it seems like these these systems would be interoperable. And your only case where there'd be an issue is if a connector does try to implement forwarding and delivery, as Stefan said, tries to deliver and the payment gets rejected. But if that connector is smart, it's probably implemented forwarding and delivery and some ability to recover from that if payment that it makes that it tries to deliver fails because of underpayment. Uh, I don't, I don't know about, I, I think, in my opinion, these behaviors are pretty incompatible and I think it's pretty close to a protocol change. It just so happens that there's only one implementation of the connector in the entire world that implements this behavior and no one is running it 
in practice. So there's no, there's nothing that's really breaking as a result of this. I think if this was the kind of change we wanted to make in five years, it would be very breaking mm -hmm. um, because like this is the kind of recommendation that the protocol should make. And it it's it's actually kind of beyond a recommendation. It's more an expectation. It's just something that was not that clearly stated before and should be more clearly stated going forward. Yeah, I, I'm, I disagree, but I think we would need to talk through the various scenarios to see if that's the case. Uh, that, that's not worth debating now. Um, I heard somebody had a question. Um, I'm not sure who it was. I think Roger. Oh, um, yeah, I had a question about, uh, there were a couple of scenarios you mentioned if there was an overpayment, say it's just a, a, a few cents over or whatever because of a, a mismatch in how the, the fees were applied, say, for the actual payment that went through as opposed to what was expected based on based on the quoting. Um, so you were saying there were a couple of scenarios you touched on as to what could happen then, one of them being just sending back the, the excess. Um, is that something that would that could be applied predictably um, <clears throat> or or there are other kind of that that would go back to the sender, or there are other kind of additional fees that would apply on sending that back. I, I guess, in a sense, it doesn't matter, sort of, to the extent that there are fees that apply on something that's only a rounding error, anyhow. But um, anyway, it's probably not a very important issue. But um, yeah. Um, so I think that, like, first of all, the amount that you would be overpaying is is very likely to be. Um, the sort of buffer that you put in based on like uncertainty about rates and things of that nature. Um, so on the application layer, on the transport layer, you very well may want to have some sort of mechanism that like sends the excess back uh, all the way to the sender. Um, I think more likely in practice, there's going to be some recipients that care about overpayment and I think they're going to negotiate something locally with their connection connector back is where it has like extra profit and maybe you offer lower rates as a result um, and then for the cases where um, uh, for the cases where you actually want to compensate the sender you could do that on the on the transport layer I think that doesn't need to be an ILP concern Evan, you want to yeah, I was just going to say, I think the idea of sending that little excess all the way back to the sender seems pretty unlikely because it would be it might I, I would guess that it would be an amount so small that it might not even sort of make it back all Actually, the way to the sender. The, there's a really good point here, which is the, like, how do you think about large payments going through the system? Do you think of them as going through in one chunk? In that case, yeah, there might be a significant overhead and you might want to send that back. But we're actually more and more coming to the conclusion that, like Evan mentioned in the beginning, a larger payments might be split up into smaller payments. And if that's the case, then the overhead on each individual small payment is going to be negligible probably and would also just get you closer to the total amount that you're actually like if i'm trying to send a hundred thousand dollars and each payment happens to be over by 20 cents or something for all but the last for all but the last one then it gets me closer to that hundred thousand dollars so i would always want the maximum amount to get to the receiver right At what level do you expect uh, the, um, the overpayment error to travel back? Because it seems feasible that you might also have a, a large connector who also doesn't want to be overpaid and then wants to forward that overpayment error back one more hop and request that they're sent to the so what, place. So I think that the, the, um, the way that the, the, the case where it's most likely that a connector would not want to be overpaid is if you have a one to one connector. So you essentially have a sub ledger to a high order ledger. And I think what you would do is you would just, um, when you pass back the fulfillment or when the recipient fulfills the payment, they would just pass in an amount, um, which then causes the ledger to execute that, that lower amount. And you could keep, keep that going for as long as you want. And then whatever connector is fine with over being overpaid, which, you know, that's not a very big ask. Um, you know, they would just stop passing it forward. Now, if you look at the issue, there's sort of two, two proposals. There's the, the way you just reduce it in fulfillment, and then there's the one where you actually send an error back, you go back to the last connector, um, and then that resends the payment forward, and then you fulfill, um, which either way works. Yeah, I, I prefer the idea of not having this extra ledger feature where you 
pass back the amount that you want when you fulfill it and then the ledger like gives back the rest i think it's cleaner to just say you can reject with a specific message and then any connector that implement that recognizes this will just take less and then forward or like resend the right amount and then if you don't implement this which means you don't want to be overpaid then you'll just pass back that error to the next connector and then well, like what, you'll just yeah what happens if you go I, I, that, but to do an exchange then the amount that's lower may no longer correspond to the amount that that connector paid and so if that connector retries with the lower amount it will just fail again this time with not enough money yeah. So I think there's some like open issues with that proposal. Hey guys, um, it, I, uh, another sort of observation and, a, and maybe a question. It seems like there's like a lot of inferred behavior uh, potentially in in this proposal in particular, and I'm wondering if if introducing some sort of signaling mechanism, perhaps in the packet, would help. So. Evan, you made a good point, like there aren't connectors today running sort of this current structure. And so if we move now, it might be easy, but what about in five years when there are a lot of connectors running whatever sort of iteration and, and maybe some new behavior we want to introduce, but you know, maybe we don't necessarily need everybody to do it. Like in the case of the, uh, the zero condition, um, like you, you kind of have to infer that you should maybe just not like that, that you should reject that immediately or just pass it on right like if somebody didn't actually you code that have, into their connector they you don't have to infer anything about it it's just that, like it will work if you just pass that on as if it was a normal payment just to be clear about that specific idea but i, I don't want to interrupt your the general point you're sure. making um so i, I think one, i guess at the end of that is, path though somebody would have to either like look at it and make a decision and say i guess the receiver would be like ah, i don't know what that is because i i have no record so i'm going to immediately reject or so i, I, I guess i was the, thinking like in that case you would just expire which is sort of not ideal david what i would suppose you know, you're kind of making this more general point about like, you know, sometimes you want to, you, you don't want to make a decision about going one way or the other. You want to have a lot of people to choice and then kind of have some signaling as to what they chose and what, what features are available um, potentially across a certain path. I think for this particular feature, um, the way I look at it, it was that forward versus delivery was a bad idea. I'm sorry, I was wrong. And, um, the reason I think it was a bad idea is because it kind of splits the payment paths into these two parts. One part where you can you can have exchange rates and different currencies, and one part where you can't. And what that does is it kind of makes it very difficult to extend payment chains outward, which is pretty desirable if you want to build sort of an interledger system, like a, a system where you're going across different ledgers. You want people to be able to extend those chains outwards um, and kind of sub sub ledger and kind of sub uh, contract and, and so on. And uh, yeah, and I, and I think like looking at the re looking at the use case, these other options for how to deal with this uh, overpayment um, scenario or overpayment use case, just seem way more attractive compared to the forward delivery, just in terms of like how it played out. Um, it turned out to be much harder to explain than I ever anticipated. Um, it, it poisons a lot of other stuff that you do like, you know, it, it, it requires a, a local flag in your routing table. Um, it kind of influences, you know, connector behavior. Um, it's just a very, I don't know, it, it just makes it, 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 I think the biggest thing I can say about it is that it splits the payment chain in half um, and it kind of has these different behaviors on different parts of the chain, which just makes it much harder to think about. I always have to know, am I behind a delivering connector or not? And is my LP address a LP address that's going to cause something before me to deliver or not? And that complexity is just not worth it for that little overpayment use case. And we should just solve that in a more local way that's kind of between the recipient and, and their connector. And if the recipient doesn't want to be overpaid, they should just have some feature on their ledger that allows them to pay back or give back, or give back the extra money they don't want. So, okay, that, that was that's helpful. I, I appreciate the the simplification 
I like the I like the idea actually because I like the simplification of the connector. In my particular use case, I think um, I have very large payments with low qual low quantity, and I also have sort of the requirement that the payments need to be exact. So, I guess for my use case, it would be helpful to maybe and maybe not on this call, but eventually to explore how do you handle those. So you you have a high value payment where liquidity may actually be different, right? Seems like the assumption is payments will be low. Um, and then the other one would be like getting an exact payment. So if we could explore those perhaps later even, I think that would go a long way to like making it easier for my use case. Uh, that that was part of the point I was trying to make earlier, David. And, and I, I, I really do think it's worth understanding this, but I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. I do think that forwarding versus delivery is actually an optimization you can add to a connector. It's, it's additional logic a connection, connector can choose to implement and say, I want to differentiate between whether I'm forwarding or delivering. In most cases, we're saying connectors now should just forward everything. And if they get a, an error back that says, hey, you sent too much or sent too little, then resend with a different amount. But an optimization a connector could implement is, well, instead of doing that, I try and figure out if I'm forwarding or delivering and behave differently. But that doesn't actually affect anyone else. It's just the, Adrian, you know, it's, a, it's a connect implementation decision. Adrian, it's not. So here's the reason why. If I'm do, trying to do quoting through um, uh, a connect, if I'm trying to do this end-to-end -end quoting through a connector that does try to deliver, one of two things is going to happen. And this is what I found. This was exactly what caused a problem. So if I set the amount in the packet too low and it tries to deliver it, um, then it will shave off a bunch and my quote will be super distorted. If I set the pa amount in the packet too high, the connector itself will reject that packet meaning I can't do this end-to-end -end quoting thing at all. So it's not really a behavior that a connector can choose to implement. If we move to doing end-to-end -end quoting, this will, that connector behavior will mess it up. So, so, so I think end-to-end -end quoting is also something that's not mutually exclusive. I don't think you have to say everyone must do end-to-end -end quoting or everyone must do um, you know, ILQP-based quoting or everyone must do quoting some other way. Ultimately, quoting is the sender figuring out how much to send on the first transfer to be able to get the right amount to the end. How they get that information can be you know, a variety of ways. We're providing a bunch of different protocols that potentially they could use, but end-to-end -end quoting doesn't really suit David's use case in the same way that you know, delivery of a payment that's not the exact amount doesn't suit his use case. So I think you're gonna find combinations of quoting and forwarding protocols that work well together for specific use cases. I, I think trying to pick one and say, this is what everyone has to do is, is a mistake. Whether we differentiate them based on some signaling, as David says, or try to be clever about how we design them so that they work side by side, um, I think we need to explore that a bit more. I, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think that, um generally with standards i found that if there are um two ways of doing it and they're sort of equally valid and both of them have big constituencies and they serve different use cases then it can make sense to have both support it i think in this case um if you want to um, have exact delivery you can use either evan's proposal or my proposal either way it works um the forward versus delivery proposal is just a worse way to do it and so I don't see any reason for creating optionality for that mode of doing it. Sure, but we, we haven't, nowhere in, in the spec, other than in that one issue, do we even talk about forwarding versus delivery, right? It's an implementation detail. It's how we've chosen to implement our connectors today. It's definitely, kind of hang on, mind. it's definitely in the spec because the recipient, the receiver expects that to be the behavior. So um, if you just went by the spec and you, you didn't, it, consider this implementation detail, as you call it, um, you would just not be able to make payments. Uh, the if I'm the receiver and I'm expecting you to always deliver the exact amount, and the spec says, if I don't get the correct amount, I send back an error and say, sorry, you overpaid me, which is what we want to add to standard, then it 
you know, that doesn't change any, that the, the either behavior would still be valid. Okay, um, I only have a few more minutes and I did want to show up, uh, show off a quick other project that I did. So um, why don't we move the rest of the discussion to the issues? Uh, I think usually the call is, is more about getting people interested and then the actual meat cool. of the discussion yeah, happens. Let's do that. Anyway, let's do that. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, and basically what I want to show off is uh, I built a little uh, web app uh, and the purpose of it is essentially to help people uh, get started with ILP. Um, not quite ready to, to release it, um, but I'll show it off and, and kind of be interested to uh, see what people think about it. So here's what it is. So it's called ILP Quick Start and it's best basically intended to be like the fastest way that you can get onto the real money ILP network. We already have like really good ways to get credentials for the ILP testnet. Um, basically, for instance, by getting just uh, credentials for the XRP ledger testnet, and then also Michiel built uh, a faucet, a so-called interfaucet, which you, which can get you uh, money on any ledger that's connected to the ILP testnet. Um, and this is sort of the equivalent for LiveNet with real money. Now, obviously, on the LiveNet, we can't just give you money; you have to actually fund it. Um, but this is sort of intended to be a quick way to do that. So the first step is you click uh, generate secret over here. Um, so that will generate credentials for XRP Ledger. And then it'll also show you the exact configuration variables that you have to put into um, you know, your plugin configuration if you want to actually connect to that. Now, I think the format for this configuration is still kind of evolving, but I wanted to put in something so that you could kind of see you know, whatever we end up with, this is what is this is going to show, and try to make it very easy for developers to kind of, you know, get their app connected to ILP. So now I have this like empty ILP account basically that I could start receiving payments into. Um, but there's actually something I still might want to do. It's like actually putting money into it if I want to act as a sender. Um, so there's another feature down here, um, and this is powered by Shapeshift, which you might be familiar with. It's like a service that allows you to convert between different cryptocurrencies. So I can literally select any cryptocurrency down here. Um, let's say I want to use Litecoin. Um, and then what this is going to do is it's going to give me a Litecoin deposit address. It's going to say like this is the minimum amount of Litecoin that you can deposit. This is the maximum. Um, and if I send Litecoin to this address, it will essentially show up in this uh, Ripple address up here. Um, and I'll be able to use it with ILP with these credentials. And so with literally just two steps, I'm able to set up my app. I'm going to be able to fund my account um, and start playing around with, with ILP with real money. Um, the main reason we're not releasing this right now, well, actually two reasons. One is this page is not currently saving your secret, so it's pretty easy to lose your money just by you know, pressing F5 and, and you close the page if it doesn't out. Um, and then the second issue is that um, this is currently using XRP Ledger, so it's kind of a creating Ledger accounts um, on the XRP Ledger. And one of the, the 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 issues with that is that the minimum amount of the or the minimum deposit is 20 XRP, and that's actually a significant amount of money. That's like four dollars. Um, and so before we release this, we want to maybe move this over to ILP Kit or some other backend so that it doesn't actually cost money to create accounts, which I think is a little bit easier if you're just getting started. And then if you want to move up to an actual you know on Ledger account, maybe you're more fine with with paying the deposit. So anyway, that's my little project I want to show off. Awesome, thanks, Devon. Um, sounds like you guys had to had to go. Um, Michiel, if you're still on the call, it'd be great to get some uh, updates on testnet of testnets. Anything, uh, any progress in the last two weeks, or anything anyone can help you out with, any or, or maybe some feedback on your tutorials as well. Yeah, so there's, um, with the testnet of testnets, I was using a, a BTP-centric uh, architecture previously, and uh, we had some discussion about, like, Adrian and Evan and I, um, about how maybe we want to stick to the plugin-based uh, architecture. So, um, and uh, yeah, probably since we have the plugin architecture anyway, and the BTP architecture is not, uh, yeah, wouldn't, give us much to change everything. Um, I rewrote the code of the testnet uh, bootstrap nodes to be plugin centric. Um, and I just finished that uh, rewrite today. So Ben is going to review that and then we'll 
uh, see where to take that from there. Uh, and uh, yeah, while I was writing testnet code and uh, little scripts to try out, I realized that there's, um, so one part is setting up the testnet. Uh, for that, we really only need a bootstrap node that people can connect to because if there's one connector that we say that's part of the testnet by definition, and if you connect to that, then you're also part of it, and then other people can just join that little uh, um, uh, growing uh, club. So uh, yeah, that's called Amundsen. Amundsen was the first guy on the South Pole, um, and it's at the time we were freezing the BTP spec, so I, I thought it was funny to, to get a, a South Pole explorer as a, to name it after. And then um, the yeah the other thing about the testnet is the interval set, which was just we built it basically because it's such a funny idea that on the testnet of testnet, if you get a payment request, you can have it pay out to any ledger, so any testnet. So if you do have managed to create an account on a testnet, but you cannot get the false set for the test network, and you can also just create an interledger payment request and get some um, money from the interval set, and then. Basically, the testnet is now just that keeping that note running and uh, the false set. So for versioning, um, there was so in July we started discussion about versioning, and I said, well, we should tr do like maybe every six months have a version, and then we said, no, let's finish BTP and then let that be the final version. Um, so I waited a bit and we finished BTP, and since then we've been like three or four new proposals already. So I think um, uh, we should uh, agree that uh, there will not be a, a, any reason, and, or there will not be any version that's really final uh, unless uh, we cannot change it anymore because it's being used too much. So on the testnet, um, there's uh, the first version, which I call which I worked with uh, so far, it's called 17Q3, because it was during the third quarter of 2017. And um, once I've, uh, yes, yeah, so it's October already, so um, I can already start with developing the Q4 version, which has a few small changes to BTP and to some of the protocols, how they're wrapped in the legend plugin interface. Um, so yeah, apart from that, there's the tutorials. So I started, just did the one, the first tutorial called Letter Shop, which is a, a little, web shop where you can buy a letter. Um, and uh, I posted that in the chat earlier. Uh, it's not really public yet. We want some people to test drive it first. And then from there, uh, I'm writing one about HTTP ILP, which is uh, using HTTP response headers to request payments. And uh, I'll do one about, um, I'm also working on one about how to join the testnet and using the interface set. Uh, other people can write more tutorials about their favorite topics. Uh, we haven't written anything about quoting yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we should also keep the tutorials a bit more stable. So uh, if you think in sort of three month chunks of time, then you can say, we are making lots of changes to the specs for three months, and then we have three months to develop one new bulk version stack, which has all the latest insights, and we can just take three months to develop that once every quarter. And then after that, once we have a new version, then the third quarter of the life cycle, that becomes the version that we use in the tutorials. Um, and then we also keep these versions live on the testnet for a while so that it's not like if somebody writes something, then the next week their demo is not going to work anymore because the testnet already moved on to a new version. Um, that's basically what I've been working on. I've got, I've worked ahead a lot. I've got a lot of, I've got about 12 open PRs, I think. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth in review. Um, yeah, if there are any questions about testnet, come to the uh, Gitter channel. It's called test, uh, is it called testnet of testnets on Gitter, uh, Gitter Interledger. Um, any questions about tutorials? Uh, yeah, go to the GitHub issues. And uh, that's it for me, I think. Cool, thanks, Mikhail. Um, any questions for Mikhail? Anybody uh, who's tried out using the testnet have any feedback? 
Yeah, Roger here. Um, so it's, it's not feedback and not at a detail level. I'll, I'll apologize at first for sort of following this sort of fairly superficially. But I wonder, Mikhail, if you could just give a quick recap of sort of who are, what, what are the different ledgers that are kind of currently on or connected to the test net at present? And also in terms of actually being able to move, uh, move funds between them, um, perhaps you could also kind of give a quick overview of the role of connector. So currently it's uh, only XRP testnet and the Ethereum Rinkeby testnet. So Ethereum testnets, there have been a few generations that are now using the Rinkeby testnet. Uh, it was kind of uh, shaky when I started using it a few months ago, but it seems to be quite stable now. So um, yeah, only those two and only on Ledger escrow, so no uh, payment channels yet. But um, yeah, the plan is obviously to add uh, more ledgers and also to add payment channels um, and uh, I guess it's uh, yeah I'll be working on splitting my time between adding ledgers to the testnet and writing more tutorials to teach people about it. Okay my, my apologies Mikhail I just had a network issue just as you were replying to my question there I don't want to make you repeat it but um is there is there a place to go to sort of track the status of of that kind of thing as um yeah there's the the testnet of testnet's Gitter channel um and uh we haven't written about we haven't linked to the testnet from the main uh, interledger.org website yet but we'll probably do that soon um so there was yeah there's the first generation of tutorials which I wrote on the on the Interledger wiki I'll I'll post a few links in the chat um, but um, yeah you can always just ask about it in the testnet of testnet Skitter channel uh, but anyway yeah for now it's just um, XRP and Ethereum that are, have been connected and only the escrow not the payment channels yet. Got it. Thanks. Okay. And actually, sorry, a follow-up question yeah. on that. I, I, I saw some discussion before. I mean, Bitcoin is obviously the cryptocurrency with the sort of the highest volume out there. Um, was there some discussion before? And again, uh, my apologies. It's something of an ignorant question, I suspect. Um, that sort of what what would be required for Bitcoin to be added to this? And I recall some discussion about whether Lightning was implementing the kinds of capabilities on top of Bitcoin that might be necessary? Yeah, we want yeah, to so the, the main, yeah we, we definitely want to support Bitcoin. There's some things that make it challenging, namely just how expensive Bitcoin transactions are and how slow they are. Um, you can do it with payment channels. The problem is it involves a little bit more setup. And so we've, we've spent a bunch of time trying to think through what the right experience to use a ledger like that is there is some feeling that maybe we should just wait until lightning support is live because that would be slightly easier to, to integrate with that said lightning also has a bunch of feature or a bunch of things that make it kind of difficult for something like into integrate with um, for example the way that they've set up the conditions is quite tied into Kind of what we would call the transport protocol in interledger and so there's not there's a pretty tight coupling between the functionality uh if that was separated out separated out a little bit more it would be easier to integrate but very overall very good question and it's something that we're thinking about a lot but don't really have the answer to so maybe we should dedicate some some time on the next call or start some threads on the on the issues about um, like ways to integrate these other ledgers yeah if if, um, if people have priority ledgers that they would like to integrate it'd be great to hear from you I, I answered a question on stack overflow yesterday about somebody inquiring uh, whether any of the hyperledger ledgers have integration um, or, or connectors for uh, interledger as well so there's there's any interest um, if people are interested in doing that work, uh, would would really like to be helpful in that regard. I think the quickest and easiest thing to do is to write a ledger plugin uh, and then run the reference connector or, or client software. But um, there's also a bunch of good frameworks available depending on how you want to implement that plugin. So you know, get on the Gitter channel, um, ask your questions. There's you know 
a lot of people there, I think, can be very helpful in getting you started if that is something you want to do. Okay, um, we've only got a few minutes left, so I, I think no, no, um, not worth trying to pick up any new topics now. Uh, I should say lots to discuss on the issue list. Um, looking forward to seeing that discussion. And thanks everyone for joining. We'll uh, we'll pick up again in two weeks' time. Uh, don't forget we're having a few meetups next month. So we're having a meetup in San Francisco, another in Singapore, and another in Tokyo. So if you're around for any of those, please do join us. Um, details are on the website. Uh, there's short links as well. If you go to interledger.org forward slash San Francisco or forward slash Singapore or forward slash Tokyo, you will get um, you'll land on the event page and you can register and, uh, and so on. So please do register. Let us know if you're coming. We, we want to plan, make sure we've got enough food and drinks for everyone and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Thanks again and uh, travel safe, those of you traveling. Enjoy Tanzania uh, on an event.